Okay, uh, a couple of items for you at the top. Obviously, this is a tremendously historic day uh, in the White House and in the country, and this is a fulfillment of a promise the President made to the country. His time on the Judiciary Committee was defining for him and gave him historically exceptional preparation for what we would consider a smooth process characterized by heavy engagement with both parties in the Senate during both the advice and consent phases. He promised to choose a successor in the mold of Justice Breyer, as Republicans and Democrats called for, and after thorough consideration, as you know, chose uh, Judge Jackson. The President's outreach, Justice Jackson, I guess we can now call her, uh, the President's outreach continued at this stage, calling senators in both parties early about his choice. Out of the gate, he proved he had chosen someone in the tradition by immediately getting endorsed by the fraternity, Fraternal Order of Police and Judge Thomas Griffith, followed by a procession of leading conservative legal, legal minds and additional law enforcement organizations. As we've talked about in here a bit, she began her prep work immediately, starting the day after she was announced and promised to meet with anyone who wanted to and honored it meeting with 97 senators over the course of her consultation. She further displayed her work ethic, extraordinary credentials and character when she testified for over 20 hours and answered the most QFRs of any SCOTUS nominee ever. Um, <clears throat> we uh, also functioned seamlessly with the Judiciary Committee and leadership, and we were conscientious about being good resource to Republicans. Uh, Senator Jones and the additional staff brought on during the process made invaluable contributions essential to success. Um, also wanted to uh, highlight that on uh, UI data that was released today, uh, as you can see in here, the comparison between January of 2021 and March now that we are in of 2022. Uh, over the last four weeks, fewer Americans filed initial claims for unemployment insurance than any time in recorded history. Since President Ob Biden took office, our economy has added 7.9 million jobs. That's more jobs created on average per month than any other president in history. And last month, the unemployment rate fell to 3.6 percent, down from 6.7 percent when the president took office about 15 months ago. This historic job growth is a direct result of the American Rescue Plan, which funded our vaccine nation strategy, reopen schools, and help grow the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. <clears throat> Last item for you before we get to your questions. Uh, across the country, as we've talked about a bit in here, Republican elected officials are engaging in a disturbing, cynical trend of attacking vulnerable transgender kids for purely partisan political reasons. Today in Alabama, instead of focusing on critical kitchen table issues like the economy, COVID, or addressing the country's mental health crisis, Republican lawmakers are currently debating legislation that, among many things, would target trans use with tactics that threatens to put pediatricians in prison if they provide medically necessary, life-saving health care for the kids they serve. Just like the extreme government overreach we've seen in Texas, where politicians have sent state officials into the homes of loving parents to investigate them for abuse just to harass and intimidate the LGBTQI plus community, today vote in Alabama will only serve to harm kids. But Alabama's lawmakers and other legislators who are contemplating these discriminatory, discriminatory bills have been put on notice by the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services that laws and policies preventing care that health care professionals recommend for transgender minors may violate the Constitution and federal law. To be clear, every major medical association agrees that gender-affirming health care for transgender kids is a best practice and potentially life-saving. All of this begs an important question. What are these policies actually trying to solve for? 
LGBTQI uh, plus people can't be erased or forced back into any closets, and kids across our nation should be allowed to be who they are without the threat that their parents or their doctor could be imprisoned simply for helping them and loving them. Uh, President Biden has committed in both words and actions to fight for all Americans and will not hesitate to hold these states accountable. Uh, <clears throat> I would also note, since I've had a rotation of fabulous colleagues in here today, today we have Vidan Patel here. You may all know him. Any of you who work on immigration and climate issues know him very well. Um, I often joke with him that we gave him the easy assignments. We did not. It's just because he's super talented. Uh, Vidan, I'll say about him, he's a, a beautiful writer. Uh, he's a fast writer. I don't know if that means he could be a wire reporter. I think he has a very promising career in government ahead of him, uh, but just wanted to highlight Vedant and his amazing contributions and everything he does to help me, help all of us, help the president every day. With that. Perfect. I've got, uh, got three things. Thanks so much. Um, Ukraine's foreign minister at NATO today made it very clear that uh, his country needs more weapons and needs them fast. I'm wondering if it's time for the U.S and other allies to not just provide defensive weaponry, but, but actually provide offensive weaponry? Well, uh, let me give you a sense of where we are. Um, as of now, we have uh, provided, uh, committed to providing $1.7 billion of uh, weapons, of security assistance uh, to Ukraine since the beginning of this conflict, more than $2 billion since the president took office. There are transfers of, sim of sy systems nearly every single day. I would note we just announced two days ago uh, $100 million in javelins, which are a critical weapon that the Ukrainians have been using effectively to fight the Russians, push back the Russians, and defend their country. I would also note um, that as it, as, um, as, it, as it relates to the type of systems and material we are providing, for every Russian tank in Ukraine, the United States will have or has provided 10 anti-tank sim uh, systems. If you factor in contributions from allies, we're almost at 90 to 1. That means one tank, Russian tank, 10 anti-tank systems to fight them back. For every Russian armored vehicle in Ukraine, the United States will have provided about three anti-armor systems. If you factor in contributions from allies, it's about 25 to 1. The way this works, and the last thing I'll say and get to your, your next question, the way that it works is that uh, the Ukrainian leaders uh, request a range of assistance. They often provide us lists. We go through that list. We determine what we can provide. We provide a vast, vast majority of what they're requesting. If we don't have access to it, sometimes it's Russian-made military equipment. We work with our allies and partners to see what they can provide. And our focus, as our as Department of Defense officials have conveyed on the Hill when they've testified this week, has been providing, uh, providing what they are trained on uh, and what we know is effective in fighting this war, and we've already seen to date that the use of this security assistance has been central and essential in, in effectively fighting the war uh, as they have done. Uh, go ahead, Are Mara. you saying that that's sufficient, that you feel that you've given them enough? I mean, when, what do you mean by those metrics? Well, I, met, I provided them because I think it's interesting or compelling to yeah. understand, right, uh, the range and the significance of and the totality of the type of assistance we've provided. We have not stopped, nor are we stopping providing additional security assistance. We have announcements nearly every couple of days. I just think that, to me, was interesting and compelling to better understand uh, the significance and the broad scope of the assistance we've provided. But you're saying there'll be no let up in your efforts to provide No, I, them with I don't more. think I conveyed that in, yeah, okay. in any in any way. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just to kind of follow up on that, uh, the Secretary of State yesterday in a, the Russian language telegram channel said, uh, quote, we're looking at other systems, some of them larger, more sophisticated, that may be useful going forward. Is he talking about the, the systems that allies might have that we're trying to backfill? Or what, what was, for Clarity's perspective, was he trying to say that? Well, Partly, yes, because there are systems, of course, we have access to. We have the best military in the world. We have a range of systems we have access to that we have been providing. We will continue to provide. Uh, there are certain systems, as, as you've noted, the S-300 is one of them, of course, uh, where they have requested. We continue to work with allies and partners on what systems and, uh, uh, and equipment they have access to and they would have the capacity to provide. Sometimes that means backfilling systems. And there is also assist, uh, systems and t uh, weapon systems that that they may request that we may not talk about because for operational reasons uh, and their own um, uh, process, it wouldn't be uh, to their benefit to do that. So he's potentially talking about U.S. systems that we just aren't necessarily aware of at this point? 
uh, he's, he's talking about, we're not going to detail, uh, always, every type of system or every type of weapon we're going to work with allies to provide or provide. We have, provi we have detailed it quite extensively from here, but we're not going to detail everything we haven't over the course of time for operational purposes. But what he was conveying is that we'll continue to work with our partners and allies in uh, meeting the needs and the requests that the Ukrainians uh, have put forward. And then uh, Germany's Foreign Intelligence Service uh, briefed the Parliamentary Committee over there that it intercepted radio communications of Russian soldiers talking about killing civilians. Is the U.S. either aware of that intelligence or does it have any intercepts of its own that, that show something similar? I have seen the reports, but I don't have anything more on those reports or the intelligence. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, um, I guess the president obviously tested negative today, and according to CDC guidelines. Yesterday. I'm sorry, yesterday. Yes. And Speaker Pelosi was not considered a close contact, but it seems like a very close call. I know you've said that he had a second booster and that he's following CDC guidelines, but given the importance of his role and his age, is the White House considering any stricter measures to keep him safe, more mask wearing, fewer big venue events, more outdoor events? Well, when you say it's a close call, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Close call in the sense that they were in two events at the White House together within two days. She tested positive. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, for clarity purposes, what the way a close contact is defined, it's not arbitrary. It's not something made up by the White House. It's CDC guidelines, and how they define it is being within six feet for a cumulative total of 15 minutes over a 24-hour period that they were not. Uh, all of their interactions were publicly available. I think you saw them. Um, and that's how that assessment is made. Uh, in terms of additional testing or anything along those lines, uh, that those assessments would be made by the president's doctor. He was tested last evening and tested negative. We have incredibly stringent protocols here at the White House that uh, we keep in place to keep the president safe, to keep everybody safe. Um, those go over and above uh, CDC guidelines, and that includes um, ensuring that anyone who is going to be around the president um, is uh, tested. Every member of the staff is on a regular testing protocol. If you're going to see him in person, whether you're traveling with him or you're meeting in the Oval Office, you will be tested. Uh, if you, we, we try to do socially distanced meetings when necessary. For those employees who test positive, they are required to isolate, of course, in alignment with CDC guidance, must test negative before returning to work. That is also a step that goes over and above. But we, we are going to continue to follow the protocols. And I would remind you and reiterate that uh, we also put out a plan just uh, a month ago uh, that made clear that, well, COVID-19 will continue to be with us and we will see cases rise and fall as we are seeing them rise now to be expected given the transmissibility of BA2. Uh, we can now, uh, we now have steps to uh, to go back to many of our normal routines in, ali in alignment with what the CDC continues to recommend. And, and, and given the fact that there has been this uptick among, you know, people who have been following <laughs> CDC guidelines. Are there plans to revisit those guidelines or, or edit them in some way, given the uptick? That would be up to the CDC. But again, I think when they put out these guidelines, they made clear that it was about looking at data on hospitalizations and even deaths. And what we have a plan to address, and I would note, I have, I have it with me because we really like COVID props this week right here. We have copies for anyone who would like a copy. And this is a 100-page preparedness plan that we put out that uh, it meant to protect against and treat COVID, prepare for new variants, prevent shutdowns, vaccinate the world. We expected there to be um, ups and downs and increases. And with a transmissible, a variant that's as transmissible as BA2, that's what we're seeing at this point in time in the White House, uh, in among the press corps, among the general public. And uh, the most important message we're sending to the public is that uh, we have steps in place uh, that we can take to continue to address it. And even as we're continuing to fight uh, COVID, uh, we can, uh, for the most part, return to our normal routines. And quickly on another topic, yeah. um, Congress voted to remove most favored nation trade status for Russia and Belarus and ban oil imports. Does President Biden- 100 to zero. Right? Exactly. Yes. Uh, yes. This is something the president uh, supports, had called for, and certainly plans to sign it. Back on COVID, you just said that anyone who's around the president is tested. Does that apply just to executive office employees, or, or is that true also of any members of Congress or invited guests who are here? At the there are individuals who have a meeting with the president. That's what I was referring to, our own protocols. Now, if you're at an event, obviously there are assessments made on a case-by-case, -case, but if somebody is going to be in close proximity, standing next to him, sitting next to him on a stage, 
that would be obviously different than a broad group of attendees. And given sort of the uptick in cases that we've seen here at the White House, on the Hill, there seems to be you know, cases going around within the political world here in Washington, and the fact that sometimes you do go beyond the CDC recommended guidelines, uh, is there any plan just to test the president daily for the next few days or week or so? That would be a decision made by his doctor, but that is not deemed to be necessary at this point. And on another topic, um, a, a service agent from the First Lady's detail was placed on administrative leave after they associated with and were provided gifts from two men who were pretending to be Homeland Security Investigations agents. Uh, is the First Lady aware of this? The President aware of this? How concerned are they? I don't have any comment from here. I'd point you to uh, the Secret Service um, and others investigating. But just, do you have any further guidance on what these two men were after or who they may have been working it's with? It's being investigated, and I would point you to the uh, proper agencies for any further comment. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, back on COVID. It's, it's pretty clear that vaccines and boosters are not going to prevent you from getting COVID. But we know from science that masking does. Um, given you yourself saying, you know, how transmissible BA2 is, are there any conversations happening here on campus at the White House to reinstate a, a mask mandate? We would continue to follow CDC guidance. That's not what they're recommending, given we are in a yellow zone at this point in time. There are individuals who are masked because they are a close contact, and that is part of our protocols. They have had a close contact, and that's part of our protocols. And individuals who may decide to mask because uh, they have health issues in their family, personally, and that's something we also certainly support. But we would always abide by CDC guidance and go beyond it if necessary. Given what you've said about the plan in place and about living with COVID, um, is the end goal not to stop the spread anymore? Is it just to stop severe cases? Well, or again, are you still trying to stop the spread? Of course, we're trying to stop the spread, and we have the means to address that. We're also, though, I would point you to the 100 page plan we put out just a month ago, where it made clear that we uh, will continue to see COVID. COVID will continue to be with us. We will see cases rise and fall. We now know how to protect ourselves from hospitalization and death, which is hugely important. We know how, um, how much of getting vaccinated, getting boosted can protect you. And we know here in the White House, of course, 99% of people are vaccinated. Many, many people are boosted. Um, and so we have policies that, that also go even beyond. What is most important right now as we're looking broadly to the country is the fact that we uh, are are very concerned about the failure of Congress to continue to fund our COVID response, the fact that we have needed to therefore end our program for the uninsured. We are not going to be able to uh, make purchases of uh, a broad scope of boosters of, of, um, of Evichel, to, which is uh, a treatment for immunocompromised or preventative treatment for immunocompromised, uh, that when we get to the end of June, our testing capacity will be at risk of collapsing. And as we're looking broadly beyond the White House of how we're planning, that is our greatest biggest concern at this point in time. Thanks. Just one more yeah. on the news yeah. of the day. Sure. You just talked about how his, historic today was um, uh, for um, Judge Jackson to be confirmed, but uh, no reporters were allowed in the room, no TV cameras were allowed in the room to help record that history. Can you help us understand that decision? Well, today was meant to be a private moment uh, between the president and uh, Judge Jackson, and we made a decision late in the process that we would have some photographers, some of your colleagues in the news media, in the room to capture it for history. Those photos have been used by networks, including likely your network, over the course of the last hour. Uh, but this was meant to be a private moment. Tomorrow, as we've announced, we have an event, a moment in history, where uh, certainly the president will be speaking. We will have a range of guests. It will be an outside event, and we'll be marking it in that way. Yes. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. How can you guys say that President Biden was not a close contact with Speaker <coughs> Pelosi when there is video of the speaker kissing him? Well, Peter, the way that it is defined is by the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, and their definition of it is 15 minutes of, of contact within a set period of time uh, and within six feet. Uh, it did not meet that bar. It does not mean that, uh, that no one will get COVID around the world who does not have a close contact. It just means we are defining for all of you uh, whether the president and their interaction met the definition of the CDC of a close contact. Half the cabinet was there on Tuesday. At least two additional cabinet members, Raimondo and Garland, already have COVID. Is there a threat that this is going to be a national security problem if the, if the cabinet comes to the White House and starts getting infected with COVID? Well, I don't think, Peter, we can assess where they where they 
got COVID or where, where, they, uh, where they acquired COVID or whatever the right way to say that is. Uh, I don't know that it was Tuesday. There are other events, obviously, that have happened over the course of the last week as well. Uh, they are all boosted. Uh, they are all, uh, many of them are able to work from home, as many uh, staff and even reporters are, uh, who are who are vaccinated and boosted. Uh, and they all have a, a talented and experienced team who is stepping into their shoes where needed in the office. When the last president wanted to host a big event for a Supreme Court nominee here at the White House, some folks got COVID and then former Vice President Biden called it a super spreader event. So is there any risk that this event tomorrow for a Biden Supreme Court now uh, justice is going to be a super spreader event? Well, one, at that point in time, vaccines weren't available. People were not vaccinated. It certainly puts us in a different space. This event is also going to be outside tomorrow. Uh, and then on a different topic, when Title 42 expires next month, what is the plan for the 18,000 migrants a day that are going to cross? Do you want them to get jobs here? Is there something else that you want these 18,000 a day to be doing? I don't know where you're basing your specific numbers on, Peter, but what I would tell you. Uh, I've got it right here. Earlier this week, the department gave reporters an estimate that up to 18,000 migrants could be apprehended at the border each day if Title 42 were well, be up, up to. Be and we'll see what happens. And obviously, we're taking steps to convey that this is not the time to come. Uh, individuals who come to the border, this is what would happen. CBP and ICE would work together to ensure that anyone who enters the country without authorization is put into immigration proceedings as quickly as possible. CBP has been working with ICE to ensure individuals awaiting processing in the interior of the country monitor under, would be monitored under the alternatives to detention program. We know that to date nearly 80 percent of non-citizens waiting in the interior under prosecu prosecutorial discretion have either received a notice to appear or are still within their window to report. That is what would happen. In addition, I would note the Department of Homeland Security also put together a preparedness plan to continue addressing irregular migration that involves surging personnel and resources to the border, improving border processing, implementing mitigation measures, and working with other countries in the hemisphere to manage migration. Those are all steps that they're working to do in order to implement when we get to that point in time. And the last one on this. Now that the Texas governor is saying that he's going to start busing border crossers to Washington, D.C., when they get here, are you guys going to help them find a place to stay and something for them to do? Well, I'm not aware of what authority uh, the governor would be doing that under. I think it's pretty clear this is a publicity stunt. His own uh, office admits that a migrant would need to voluntarily uh, be transported, um, and then he can't compel them to because, again, enforcement of our country's immigration laws lies with the federal government, well, not a state. To Washington, D.C.? Well, listen, I don't know, but I know that the governor of uh, Texas or any state does not have the legal authority to compel tell anyone to get on a bus. Go ahead. Yeah. Jen, is there pressure to avoid saying that President Biden has a clo had a close contact given his position and the demands of his schedule? No, we announced yesterday the vice president had a close contact. And if there is 15 minutes that he spends with somebody in person within six feet and they test positive for COVID, then that would be a close contact. So given you said it's not doesn't necessarily take 15 minutes to get COVID, right? So it could take less than that. Obviously, he was around Nancy Pelosi and many others. Are you doing anything differently? Is there anything being done differently given that circumstance for the president? He was tested last night and tested negative. And if his doctor deems he should be tested more frequently, he certainly could do that. But again, the CDC guidelines are in place and the CDC um, uh, specifics on what a close contact and how it's defined are in place for a reason, to give everybody clear data-driven guidance. It is clear, but it's not always accurate, right? Because it doesn't take 15 minutes to get COVID. And this is more transmissible, this latest variant than other variants in the past. It doesn't necessarily require that much time. For example, yesterday we were in the state dining room. The president was face to face with many individuals right up in their mugs for extended periods of time because he was enjoying uh, this moment and a chance to visit with folks. So for clarity, not everybody in that room was tested in advance of arriving, correct? Correct. So some of those people who may have been further back but ultimately had, I don't know, five minutes, we watched for an hour literally, in the room, may not have been with him for 15 minutes but could have been in his face having not been tested for an extended well, again, period of time. Well, again, if individuals are within uh, six feet of him for 15 minutes or more, that's considered a close contact. No one in there was. Contagio that Brown I'm aware. Jackson tested negative before her visit today, I trust. I don't have any more details on Contagio Brown Jackson's well, testing you, protocols. Let me ask you about the Secret Service uh, very quickly if I can. Does the President maintain confidence in the Director of the Secret Service, James Murray? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, get some clarity. Uh, is it your sense that uh, just Judge Jackson will ascend to the bench sooner than the end of the term? Because our understanding was that Justice Breyer was going to retire at the end of the term. I, I don't have any updates on that, but or any changes to that. No. Um, I want to give you a chance to respond. Uh, Jonathan Swan did an interview with Mitch McConnell this morning, in which he Swan asked McConnell whether if the Republicans should take the Senate in the midterm elections and another vacancy should occur while this president is still in office, whether a Republican-controlled Senate would hold a hearing on another Biden nominee. He refused to answer that question. Do you have a response to that? What do you think it says about this, the health of our constitutional system? Well, I think given it's a day where, uh, with bipartisan support, we have a new uh, we are about to have a new member of the Supreme Court, a historic and eminently qualified member of the Supreme Court, and she did get three uh, Republicans supporting her. That is that is a good sign and something we should take a moment to celebrate. Uh, certainly, we don't anticipate or predict. I have no prediction of an additional opening, but we would certainly expect and call for all members of the Senate to to uh, operate as professionally as the President and our team did in this case, which is uh, ensuring that there was advice and consent that she met that the our nominee met with 97 senators. That's obviously a great, uh, great number from the other party. That is how we would conduct ourselves, and we would expect the, uh, the same in response. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. CDC aside and, and distance, and et cetera, has the president expressed any a surprise or a amazement that, 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 that there's a number of cases around him? And is he, is he asked for people to stay away? What, what's his, just his kind of human level res response to what's going on? No. <laughs> no, he's completely, completely <laughs> nonplussed by the fact that a growing number of people around him are getting COVID. We have anticipated that there would be rising numbers of COVID cases. It is not the numbers in here where where it was around Omicron, uh, and I don't know if it was among the press court. Certainly wasn't among the general public. Uh, he knows there are a number of steps and precautions that we put in place, and we take to protect him and protect the vice president and other senior members of the team. That includes testing. Uh, that it, for anybody who goes to see him, that includes uh, social distancing in meetings whenever possible, a step we take, an additional precautionary step we take uh, in order to protect him and protect other senior members of the White House. Is there any, just, a, just a second question, if I yeah. can. Is, is there any ongoing or uh, a future, near future conversations with China uh, on the Russia situation, or has the U.S. just concluded uh, China's not going to budge on its position, which is to not really get involved and, and try to push them off? There will be ongoing conversations with China, I would expect, um, including our expectation that they abide by sanctions and that they not provide material support to Russia. I don't have anything to predict in terms of which channel it will happen through uh, next, but certainly I would expect there will be ongoing and continued conversations. Can I ask whether it's the view of the President's position that if he gets COVID, he'll have a mild case because if he has to pass a second booster, given his age and given his health profile, do you expect it not to be a serious case if he were to get it? Well, I think that is what we see statistically um, and through uh, as we look at health analysis and data. But obviously, uh, you know, we would he would be treated by his doctor, and I'm not going to make a prediction of that at this point in time. Is it fair for us to conclude that the event tomorrow was a factor in it being outside and being tomorrow given outside of training today? It's supposed it's to be a beautiful day. That is a big factor. Is it fair to think public risk was? part of the calculus in deciding how to mark this confirmation. Did you, well, well, I would, is that part of the reason it's outside? I would tell you that the biggest factors are actually that, uh, and we would have had events outside earlier in the week, too, had the weather allowed. Um, it is that time of year. And certainly, we do know that it is better to have events outside when you can have them outside. It is meant to be, it is supposed to be a beautiful day. I'm not a weather person, but that is what everything is telling us. Um, and also, we want to be able to invite a large number of people, and uh, this would enable us to do that. So those are the biggest factors. But there's no question, Josh, that that also is true uh, statistically. Or the the CDC is actually a little less clear in the link between the two uh, clauses that you're linking. They talk about, was this person less than six feet away from someone? Yes. And the person defined the case. And they, ask, they say to consider the time spent with someone starting two days before. So that includes both the ACA event and yesterday's event. And then separately, they say, have they been in the presence of someone uh, with confirmed or suspected COVID for a cumulative total over 15 minutes or more over a 24-hour period? As far as we know, Speaker Pelosi might have left right after the event. That was about 14 minutes yesterday. And they spent about 45 minutes for the day before. So it's, but it's she the wasn't White House position. Mm -hmm. that, but she was like seven feet away. I mean, she was, you know, as far as here. 
So it's a wide position, but President Biden, 14 minutes, 7 feet away from Speaker Pelosi, is not a close contact, but 15 minutes, 6 feet away would have been a close contact. And I asked, by way of saying, was there a, a discussion of whether to treat him as a close contact or anybody? Well, he is tested regularly, as you know. He was tested yesterday. He will be tested again soon. He's tested typically a couple of times a week. If he, is a, if he were a close contact, the only difference, or I don't even know that it would be a difference, would be a five-day a five day te a test five days after your contact. You know, you so, have to wear a mask for 10 days in public. Okay, and if, and if he is a close contact, that is what exactly he will do. Okay, and to yeah. answer on the, on the broader COVID question, it looks like that bill is stalled now. Uh, what are the short-term consequences of not having new funding in place? Is there a risk that you can't proceed with previously announced funding, namely of Pfizer's bill Paxlovid? And when do you think the shipments of the monoclonal antibodies will run out? They were supposed to run out in May. If you've been shipping fewer of them, how long will the cupboard last on the monoclonals without new money? I may have to check on that specific component for you, Josh, and I'm happy to do that. I mean, what we do know is that by the end of June, the testing capacity will be at risk. Our testing capacity will be at the risk at risk of collapsing, at least from the federal government and what we can provide. Uh, we know that we can't buy any additional treatments beyond those that have already been paid for and contracted, of course, including preventative treatments for immunocompromised. Um, those treatments, as you know, take uh, often take six months to manufacture, so we'd also be losing out on supply that we intended to purchase for September through January. And of course, the uninsured fund is already closed. Uh, but I can certainly check on the next purchase of monoclonal uh, and, and if, if we have um, any ability to purchase Maybe that what, as planned. What's the difference if the bill passes three weeks from now versus having pa if it had passed this week? Well, we, we would be able to uh, have the funding, hopefully, to uh, reopen some of our uninsured uh, programming. We'd be able to get ahead and plan ahead for purchases of uh, of testing to ensure we had testing capacity to make sure we could uh, uh, could place some orders for um, treatment preventative treatments for the immunocompromised. It just delays the the, the process. And as we know, they're going on a two week recess right yeah. now. Julian, Thanks, I appreciate it. I have a non-COVID question, sure. I swear. But you can ask me a COVID will, question, too. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. Um, I just want to be specific about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Are folks who are attending going to be required to take any additional steps, you know, other than it being outside and all that stuff, but, you know, testing by senators, for example, or, you know, distance kept by the president? Is there going to be anything above and beyond just... Outside. Not that I'm aware of, but it being outside is certainly an important component here. Um, and uh, typically, uh, individuals who are going to be in close proximity, like on the stage or something, they would be tested, but there are protocols that are evaluated in a case by case as we have events. And a question on Puerto Rico, non COVID, okay. more, right? There's a, a million people plus without power there. A lot of people criticizing that the federal government has not done enough to fix the grid there sure. after recent hurricanes. I wonder what, you know, is, is the president ready on this? Are there any actions uh, that the president is planning to do there? Sure. Uh, let me check. I know we've provided a, a broad range and a significant amount of financial assistance, but let me let me check and see where the, what the status is at this point can, in time. Can I also ask you about the Amir Lock, uh, the, the case involving Amir Lock sure. and the officers that uh, are you know not charged in that case? <clears throat> is the president ready on that? And is there any? Any, does he have any thoughts on like the no-knock warrants? I think you, you addressed this in February a little bit, but I wonder if there's been any action or movement or further conversation about it. Well, um, let me give you, I mean, so first, like so many across the nation, and obviously this news is a reminder of uh, how we've all mourned the tragic death of Amir Locke and our thoughts and prayers continue to be with his family. Uh, the president uh, is committed, and of course he is aware of, um, um, and I would point you to the Department of Justice for any specifics about next legal actions, but uh, the president is committed to ensuring fair, impartial, and effective policing, keeping our communities safe. Those goals go hand in hand, and we can achieve them in part by building trust between the police and communities they serve. So to go to your other questions, in September, the Attorney General issued a, no, a new policy imposing restrictions on the use of no-knock warrants, chokeholds, and character, uh, restraints by federal agents. Uh, President Biden also continues to call on, uh, on Congress to pass comprehensive police reform legislation, uh, but since Republicans refuse to support the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is admit we are looking at additional steps we can take. We are continuing to look at them uh, on executive action to advance police reform, obviously something we put a pause on 
while that was being negotiated. I don't have an update on the timing of that, but uh, that is something we are continuing to look at to uh, build on, of course, the actions taken by the Department of Justice. Yeah. 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 Hi, Jen. You noted that um, Vice President Kamala Harris is considered a close contact. Um, CDC guidance um, says she wore a mask. Today she was presiding over the vote for um, Kintaji Brown Jackson and didn't wear a mask. I guess does the White House have a response to that? Was that a breach of protocol or I guess what made it different that she did have to wear a mask? I haven't seen, I'm obviously watched most parts of the vote, but I know that she was alone up kind of on the dais for the vast majority of that. Um, and of course, she has been wearing a mask otherwise. Um, but beyond that, I haven't I haven't done any further analysis. And then one more question, um, sort of on immigration. Sure. Um, there are reports that there's an increased number of Ukrainian refugees heading to this, that are at the southern border around 2000 in Tijuana. Um, I guess I was wondering, what are the administration's plans to kind of address a rise of Ukrainian refugees that might come to the southern border. Um, you know, the State Department hasn't really outlined the specifics on how they want to, you know, address allowing 100,000 um, Ukrainian re refugees to the U.S. So I guess, is there any other preparations that are being made um, in addition to whatever expected rise of migrants coming to the border um, once Title 42 ends? Sure. Well, I would say that we are still working through the policy process that hopefully we'll have more to say on soon about what specific mechanisms Ukrainians can apply who, who wish to come to the United States, even though we know the vast majority uh, have made clear they would like to stay in neighboring countries, which is why we're providing the most humanitarian assistance of any country in the world to support those efforts that neighboring countries are have undertaken uh, to host refugees. Um, there are very good questions I'm sure you have about uh, family reunification, prioritization, and whether there would be prioritization for individuals who fear uh, persecution and things along those lines. Uh, those are all important questions that are being discussed. Um, you know, we're, we are still um, implementing Title 42 at the border for anyone who comes uh, to the border, and we're working toward implementation uh, of the lifting of Title 42 uh, next month, and, and we would apply the policy to everybody, but obviously, uh, coming from any country, but obviously there would be these programs, and we'd have more details before then for sure uh, that uh, Ukrainians who are eligible would be able to apply for. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. I have two questions. The first one is budget day in Ottawa today, and uh, up to eight uh, billion dollar in new money will go to defense uh, purpose, which will bring, bring Canada's uh, defense uh, contribution to approximately 1.5 percent of the GDP, not yet to the two percent. Uh, does the administration wish Canada would do more, considering the actual war in Ukraine? Well, we, we applaud that increase, and we applaud Canada's efforts and support for us in standing up uh, against the invasion of, uh, of uh, Ukraine by President Putin and the Russians, and they are an important partner and continue to be. And my second question it goes back to um, the uh, aid the um, uh, aid you detailed at the beginning of the briefing to the uh, Russian military, all sorts of... Uh, Ukrainian military. Uh, Ukraine, yeah, Ukrainian military, of course, sorry. Um, I just want to um, verify again, uh, you, you, you refer to, you know, they, there are requests coming to you and you go through the list and sometimes you need uh, old Soviet uh, equipment. Um, are the MiG-29s still in the list and is the administration considering uh, transferring those uh, Polish plane to Ukraine? Our policy has not changed, but other countries, of course, could make that determination and decide to do, and we certainly wouldn't stand in the way, but our policy has not changed. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, when, uh, so when President Biden uh, continued the pause on student loan uh, payments or repayments, he said um, that that pause will provide continued lifeline as we recover and rebuild from the pandemic. You said today you want to stop the spread of COVID. So my question is, if we're still recovering from the pandemic, why then is Title 42 going to be relifted? Is there a, revision or a revisit? that you could look at that, and have we just recovered from the border then, does that mean? Let me see if I can unpack yeah. a few things in there. Um, first, on, on the announcement about the extension of student loan, uh, Pause, the student loan pause. What I said yesterday is also that what we look at is the impact of the pandemic on the economic recovery. And even though the economy has is very strong, look at the UI data from today, look at the jobs data from last Friday, we certainly know that costs are continuing to impact people across the country, including students who have, who have uh, or 
former students um, who have uh, student loan payments they need to make. And the president's going to look for every way he can lower costs for the American people, uh, whether that is the family fix uh, that he announced with former President Obama earlier this week or the announcement about the pause on student loan payments. Uh, the decision about Title 42 is a decision made by the CDC, a public health decision. It's not an immigration authority or policy. It's a public health decision. And we respect the authority given to them by Congress to make that determination. The president said that uh, sanctions were not a deterrent on Russia going into Ukraine. Um, yesterday, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is saying that the U.S. would use all its sanctioned tools should China move towards Taiwan. So is that message a deterrent or not? Well, we have sanctioned China in the past, as you know, for human rights abuses, and we have sanctioned a range of countries, uh, certainly around the world. I would say sanctions have a range of purposes, including putting consequences in place. And where we are as it relates to the war in uh, Ukraine is also making it much more difficult for President Putin to fund this war, and that is a huge priority to us. I don't have any predictions about future sanctions. I would leave that at the comments of the Treasury given Secretary. How, given how intertwined our economies are, could we really do sanctions? on China like we are. That is an assessment that the Department of Treasury would have to make, but I don't have a prediction beyond what the Secretary of Treasury said. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, yeah. This week you've been critical of Republicans trying to add amendment votes onto the COVID funding bill, um, specifically regarding Title 42. Yesterday you said they decided to move the goalposts and that the White House is questioning whether Republicans are acting in good faith or if they're just playing politics. But Democratic Senators Mark Kelly, Kristen Sinema, Joe Manchin, Maggie Hassan, and John Tester are joining Republicans in this effort. Uh, does the White House have the same criticism we've heard about Republicans? Does that apply to these Democratic senators as well? Look, regardless of who's standing against this, our larger point here is uh, if we do not have treatments, vaccines, or tests that the American people need, Americans will die from COVID. And whether they support or oppose the administration on immigration or child care or envi environmental rules, anybody. Um, and so our point, it's not political. Uh, the vast majority of people who are opposing this moving forward are Republicans. That is a fact. Uh, but our, our point here is that there is an urgency to move forward. We can have a range of debates about a range of issues we have disagreements on. That's fine. Immigration, child care, environmental rules, we welcome that. By the way, the president put forward an immigration bill his first day in office. If Republicans want to work on immigration, come on down to the White House. We're happy to work with you on it. Uh, but right now, this is a game of politics, and we need to get this funding. Otherwise, people in the country are going to die. That's our larger point. And a quick follow-up on, uh, on Vice President Harris. And yeah. She was a close contact. Tomorrow during the event, or if there's any reception behind the scenes, will she be required to wear a mask indoors? She'll follow CDC protocols in any of her events. Go ahead. Um, yeah, the um, congressional pool poll from, from the confirmation vote today uh, tells us that Senator Rand Paul cast his vote from the GOP cloak group. Um, he was in casual clothes without a suit jacket or tie so unable to come onto the floor. The reports I think two other Republican senators may have done similar. Is that an appropriate way to, to vote on a historic occasion like this? I will tell you I'm not spending a lot of time nor is the president thinking about the dress code of Rand Paul today. We're thinking about the historic confirmation of an eminently qualified black woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Not really worried about his khakis. And if, I, if I may as well, um, we've enjoyed your shout outs to members of your team. I wonder if this means you're now working your notice. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Whether you're now, is, it, is that an American phrase? Whether you're now working in latest? <laughs> yeah, I think it, I, it's, I don't know that it's an American phrase. Um, I, I have, I, I am, no, no, I, I love the Britishness and the accent, not to put you on, on, on notice of sort. Um, look, I, I think it is simply a reflection of uh, my appreciation for the incredible people on my team uh, that I get to work with every day. Um, I've shadowed them out in the past before. I've, made, I've, I've presented them with sashes to wear, all sorts of embarrassing things. And uh, I think working in the White House, just like being a reporter, people think you have glamorous, uh, glamorous setups back there. I'm here to confirm that is not the case, but um, our team works their tails off. There's a lot going on, and it's just simply an effort to recognize that. I have nothing to announce about. Yeah. Yes. What is this administration response to Israel for their role as mediator in this Russia? Ukraine crisis, and I have a follow-up question. Okay. Uh, well, we certainly support the efforts of a range of leaders to, that uh, who are uh, hoping to play a diplomatic role here, and there are a number of leaders around the world who have also had engagements with Russians and engagements with the Ukrainians, and we just ask that they all engage closely with Ukrainians as well. Okay. To, to help Europe develop energy independence from Russia, 
Will the Biden administration drop its opposition to the EU East Med pipeline being developed by Israel, Cyprus, and Greece? Look, I think there's going to be decisions made by European leaders about how to reduce their uh, their any any level of dependence they have on Russian oil. You've seen a number of leaders this week announce their intention to ban oil imports from Russia. But I would remind you that pipelines are a means of moving oil. It's not a means of production. Uh, but I point you to the European leaders to speak to that. Thanks so much, everyone.